Thank you, Nash, and thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that I and my group have been doing recently in an area that's also known as social media analytics. Now, you might say, why on earth should you care about social media? The, very an the simple answer is, for most of the world, most people are getting their news getting their information about new products from some form of social media. And although I'm going to give you Twitter as an example, what we're seeing here we have also seen on VK. There's a variant of it on Weibo, although it's mainly done by people because China has a lot of people. And there's a variant on Facebook. So with that being said, how, do, how does social media differ from traditional media in terms of social influence? In traditional media, like newspapers, it's all about identity formation. There's well worked out ways by which newspaper articles raise an identity, like policemen, raise it up to be a symbol, and then change how people perceive it by think linking it to stories about why those kind of people are good or bad. In contrast, in social media, it is not about identity formation. It's about control of communities. Through the creation, the manipulation of topic groups, and through the creation and manipulation of what those topic groups are talking about. And I'll give you some examples today. Now, just so that we're sort of on the same page and explaining what I'm talking about, <clears throat> when we talk about uh, the networks here, we, there's um, a notion of a super spreader. There's a notion of a super friend and an echo chamber, and we'll talk about what those are in a second. But the main thing is, if we look at people like Phryne and Indy here, uh, what's different about them is simply that Phryne, everyone she's connected to, can, most of them connect back to her. So she's influenced and influences a lot of people. In contrast, India seems to be actually uh, influencing a lot of people with very few people influencing him back. Now, if that was all the world we'd say there was, we'd say Indy is a much more independent individual. In contrast, if they're in an overarching network, something like this, what you see up here is an echo chamber. It's a strong echo chamber formed of a set of individuals who are all linked to each other. In Twitter, that would be they're co-mentioning each other or co-retweeting. They all link into Indy, forming a much stronger signal into him that is much more influential because of the commonality of information. Within echo chambers, once an idea gets into them, it spreads like wildfire, everyone adopts it, and the emotions escalate. And if they escalate too much, people start dropping out, if they're people. And that's going to be an important thing. Indy is a super spreader. He actually can connect to a lot of other individuals. Uh, Phryne is known as a super friend because she connects to and is connected to a lot of other individuals. These two, she's also super spread, but the way they play roles in this system are going to be slightly different. Now, the key to understanding what's going on in social media is this notion of a topic group. A topic group is a very dense community that is dense on multiple dimensions at once. Not only are all the people more or less uh, mentioning and talking and retweeting each other, they're more or less talking about the same stuff. They're using similar hashtags. Now, you might think, well, uh, there's not that many of these, but it turns out there's a ton of these. And in fact, in uh, three, these are just three different searches we did. You can see there's several thousand topic groups that we found in each one of these searches. Regard, and this is regardless of what region of the world. It's regardless of which language you're looking in, etc. And in each of these, super spreaders are used to disseminate information, but super friends are used to control uh, the discourse. Now, how do you find these? We use a special type of ensemble clustering technique that uh, is based off of spectral clustering, but clustering across three different networks at once. Ah. Clustering across uh, the who is mentioning who, the, the undirected friend network, and as well as the co-hashtag network. Obviously, my finger wants me to show this slide. So this is who is in those networks. You've got a group, a set of individuals, you've got a set of organization, and you've got bots. Okay, so and people when they read information cannot distinguish generally and generally don't take the time to distinguish which is which. Now bots are simply, if you don't know what they are, they're basically, they could be a hijacked account, they could be an overall malicious account, they could be an innocuous account, but they tend to have some kind of mechanical or software behind it, which means they can tweet much faster than human beings, they can tweet from more locations, and so on. Many of these are innocuous. Big Ben just tweets the time of day it is, okay? 
okay? But there's a lot of these malicious ones out there, and there's actually armies of these that are being set up, and a lot of these have cyborg farms behind them with groups of individuals controlling and setting up whole bunches of these things. And some of them are set up such that if you pay attention to them, they say, oh, you can use me as long as I can tweet from your account sometimes. And most people just click yes without noticing it. So they will uh, usurp your account. Now, bots are a problem because there's a lot of them. There's a lot of estimates of how many they are. They vary dramatically in the estimates of how many they are, but there are a lot of them. Uh, there's some, more importantly, about 24% of all tweets that are out there appear to be generated by these things. And what these things do is they build social ties between groups, they influence the discussion, they spread information, and they actually have impacts on people's behavior, such as through cyber attacks and the spread of malware. Now, let me show you what the impact is. If Twitter were to get rid of bots, okay, this is an example coming from a huge uh, set of time. This is uh, almost two years' worth of time over the course of the, of the Arab Spring. These are all the associated countries. This is an area where we happen to have been collecting all the tweak data, okay, and then, you know, we take all the ones that were suspended, and we calculated the network statistics before and after. And the, what I want to point out to you is not all of these were, were bots. Some of these were other things other than bots. But the point here is there's a lot of this suspension going on. We know in some of these cases, 50% of all accounts were suspended. We also want to, I also want to point out that for you as a network analyst, this should be sort of scary because that me, what this can do is for um, uh, complex measures like closeness between us, et cetera, the measure may go up or may go down as a result of these suspensions. You cannot tell a priori. So you and you and you, if you each collect data like one day apart even, your results may look dramatically different because of the removal and suspension of bots or malicious actors. So keep that in mind. What are these bots doing? There's, we're going to show you examples of three things. Uh, one is they're used to promote uh, particular benefactors, promote particular individuals or sites to, to communities, getting them to buy in or use certain products or whatever. They're also used to build communities and then do baits and switches on them to get them to change them from being nice little people doing one thing to nice little people doing something that's not so nice. And they're also used to blend and build communities together, uh, causing them to act in particular oddball ways. So I'm going to show you examples from uh, ISIS, from um, the Ukrainian elves, uh, and then I'm going to show you some, an example from the alt-right, which we got by actually studying Ukrainian elves, um, the alt-right in the US. This is the Fear of Gnome bot. This is actually associated, this network here is actually a network that was collected from Twitter, starting with known members of ISIS. Not everybody in here is a member of ISIS. Many of them are Syrian expats. The blue means their account was suspended. Uh, this also happens to be in, US, in uh, English and Arabic characters. This is only English. This is all Arabic. What this really tells you is that Twitter can't read Arabic. OK. Uh, this is the Fear of Gnome bot. This is the Fear of Gnome bot. What this Fear of Gnome bot did is it formed an echo chamber. This is all bots. They started citing, they started mentioning each other. So you get these long strings of mentions. That actually tricks Twitter, Twitter into prioritizing them to individuals. They then found uh, a super spreader in this group here, in this group here. They found the super spreader who was an imam. The imam may know nothing about this group, okay? But they start then mentioning the super spreader. That then tricks Twitter into prioritizing messages, not from, just from the super spreader, but any messages from that bot that also mentioned the super spreader to the users. Once, they, once people start then following them back because of Twitter's recommendation, they then started uh, linking to this site, which was the Benefactor Agent, which was a site for a charity for money for the children of Syria, which is actually a money laundering site for ISIS. So the bot caused that change in community behavior by understanding how Twitter worked. Here's a second example. This one is actually coming from the Ukrainian elves. There's, in this particular thing, what they were doing was they were shaping the community narratives. In this case, there were a group of young men who were tweeting. Every now and then they had a very provocative picture of women, okay? And, but they weren't necessarily a community. 
This bot came in there, formed a, its echo chamber, started finding these individuals and tweeting out and, caught, and retweeting some of their images. Now, because they've got this echo chamber, it tricked Twitter into recommending anything they recommended to each other. So now that helped all these young men find each other. So they formed a, a group of young Ukrainian guys sending provocative pictures. Okay, And then once the community was formed, what this bot did is it started then sending out messages every so on about how to militarize and where to go buy weapons. And the group became much more interested in weaponization and fighting uh, Russia. Okay, so this is an example of a, this, this is one of the bots that was within that. This is the group that they formed. This is the bots in, inside in this dense community, and they're getting them increasingly violent uh, activation. Okay, you also see these guys in marketing all the time. This is all these red things here are bots. They tend to stand out. Each one of these is a social influence bot. It's not just one thing, it's a whole bunch of them. And each one of these goes in, finds a super spreader um, to get access to the community, goes in and links to a super friend, and then changes the messages in those communities to be reflect what the group wants. These are all over the place. They're in every single thing you look at. These are examples from the, uh, all, this is from the alt-right. These are some of the uh, groups that were formed. These all, each of these are different topic groups. Each one of these has one of these social influence bots behind them. Some of these you might not be too surprised by, but interesting, this is the Evangelical South, who we'll talk more about in a minute. This gray dot here is actually the Dallas cheerleaders, for those of you who like football in the US. Not soccer, okay. Uh, this is actually, another one here is the alt-right right there. And these, well, these, all these bots came in and drove the structure of these communities. Now, what they did in this particular case is they went in, this is say, the alt-right, this is the evangelical south, that's actually one of my uh, Euro maidens, it's the same type of thing. What the bot did, they built a social influence bot, which is right in here, you can't really see it. They went out and they found a super spreader in both groups, and each of these groups has a very different political agenda. They got the super spreader. They mentioned them a lot at fair times. That caused Twitter to prioritize them to each other. Then they mentioned, and mentioned a super friend in each community. Okay, That caused Twitter to prioritize not just the messages from the bot, but it caused them to, for the evangelical south, to prioritize messages coming out of the alt-right, and now the alt-right out of the evangelical south. Now, that meant that everyone in each of those groups who had different political agendas started seeing the other group's topics. And they started to see them from somebody they trusted, one of the super friends. And it created this notion that everybody in my group must be agreeing with this, so I will too. And it made those groups move together closer. And you see this all over happening, um, the web, in terms of building communities, bridging a community, and making both groups much more conservative than they were to begin with. Okay. Now, what else are they doing? They're also linking out to various domains. They're linking out and adding in images and URLs to various regular news sites, etc. All of them will use things like YouTube and Facebook. YouTube is the most commonly used one. One of the reasons it's the most commonly used because the chance of your tweet being retweeted goes up dramatically, somewhere between six and 100 times more likely to be retweeted if you include an image or a video. So these are the ones that are typically used to spread propaganda. Moreover, they tend to include images, usually ones that are humorous. And by the inclusion of a humorous image, it actually will make the thing go viral. This is one that a bot actually shared uh, during uh, NATO's Trident Juncture exercise. I'm sorry, Anaconda exercise. This is actually a Russian bear in a cab saying, which way, you know, which way is Finland? Or, or, yeah, yeah, Finland. Yeah, like, cause, like, who knows where Finland is, right? So this is really funny, okay? At least at the, everyone at Trident Juncture thought it was funny. Anaconda thought it was funny. NATO humor, okay? So anyway, they're, they're doing this. But they're also spreading, ah, sorry, I'm very, they're also spreading fake news. This is um, data from the North Sea area. This on the left here, I'm showing it to you uh, where I've already run Louvain grouping on it. So you're, you're seeing it as groups. It's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of nodes in lots of different groups. Within this is a fake news subcore. Okay, this fake news subcore was originally brought in using some of these bots. 
This fake news subcurrent includes this really dense, dense, huge echo chamber where fake news is spread around and around and around and gets increasingly uh, strange. Uh, there's also these fake news bursts. Bursts and echo chambers are the two dominant ways in which these uh, bots and others who aren't bots, often uh, with cyborg armies between behind them, are actually spreading uh, the fake news out to the group and causing influence in these groups. Within this group, how are they doing it? Well, now we're going to go beyond the network structure. First off, in the, uh, when they're spreading fake news, one of the things they do is the fake news spreaders, which may be bots, maybe these cyborgs, um, rarely, uh, they just don't mention credible news sites. Okay? Whereas other news, they always mention, they always retweet credible news sites. Keep in mind, credible news sites like New York Times, CNN, etc., Actually, all are, are, there's only about 1% of them on Twitter, but they are always in the top 10% of the most retweeted, retweeted sites. In contrast, in fake news, what they're trying to do is these bots are being used to try to elevate uh, various other sites that are not necessarily on for credible news up to the stature of that, so people start retweeting them as often as, the, as they do others, and they do it by trying to fake out Twitter. Um, in terms of hashtags, what are they doing? Well, they're using, they're actually getting the community purchase by using hashtags that are similar to or identical to the ones used by credible news sites. So you're, if you just do a hashtag difference, you won't get that much difference. You'll get a little difference in nuance and a little difference in frequency, but you're primarily getting the same things because they want everyone who knows about topic A, whatever it is, Russia, Ukraine, whatever, they want them to also pay attention to the same fake news. They don't, want to, they don't want to announce, hey, I'm fake news, don't pay attention to me. They were just saying, I'm talking the same thing everyone else is. Okay? But then what they do is they link into different super spreaders. Other news will tend to link into the celebrities of the days, credible news sites most often. You will get a combination of like um, fake news gurus, fake news sites, et cetera, that they will be more likely to link into uh, in order to get their news escalated. They can't link to the credible news sites because they would then just denounce that as not being credible news. Okay, so if we actually then look at the spread of these things, this is actually showing you a bunch of different accounts that where we're showing uh, ones that are, they have non-fake URLs and fake URLs. So this is fake news ones, these are URLs with non-fake news. And there's a bunch of news agencies tend to be up here, mainly linking to, very rarely linking to the fake news sites, but they tend to link to other sites. These are predominantly only spreading fake news. They only link to the fake news sites. They almost never link to the non-fake ones. These are the ones you need to be scared of, okay? This is like Novo Rossiya and so on. What they do is they link about half the time to, you know, they'll link a bunch of times to the fake URL sites, and they'll link some of the time to the real news sites, okay? And they'll link to both of them because what they do is they're trying to draw in this community that is primarily is concerned with regular news, but now and then say, hey, pay attention to this little bit of interesting tidbit, which is completely fake and so on, okay? Very different profile than you get from the ones trying to send joke fake news, which are, you know, always down, always down, yeah. They're always down here and they have a very different profile. But these ones up here are the ones trying to convince people with a different political agenda. Okay, so, so what I've shown you is a variety of different things on how these various systems operate. First off, um, the one main point I want you to take away is that when you're dealing with social media, the wisdom of the crowd isn't wise anymore. It's actually very manipulated, and you can actually make the, the crowd seem absolutely stupid by the way you do the manipulation. And it's all done th through, the kind of, through this kind of social influence process. The social influence process is done a lot by, in or is enhanced by the use of bots and the use of cyborgs. Um, it, when you do these things, they bring groups together, they create groups, they bridge two groups. Once they've got the group that they want in place, they manipulate the groups. And they manipulate the group by, get, by using the Twitter system against you. Twitter will prioritize messages to you based on who else you, who else you follow and what topics are hot among those who else you follow and what hot topics are hot in general. These things are changing the ratio of how, what topics are hot. They're changing how likely those you follow. They're, they're making it look like you're following people you really aren't. And they're making it look like certain people are more important in your network than they aren't. 
Okay, if you want to influence American politics, you go in, you link to the real Donald Trump as your super spreader, okay? And then you can tweet out and get these things connected to almost every other topic group in the area. Uh, they're also used to direct attention to specific groups. They will build groups together. What we don't know yet for sure is how much they are being used to escalate violence, but we have seen evidence that when they do this at a national level and increase the amount of negative emotion in tweets toward a country, like, okay, everybody this week, let's hate, whatever, China, the number of cyber attacks on that country will increase. Okay, so it's not just about the actors. Don't pay attention to just a straight social network. It's not just about this conversation. Don't pay attention to just, uh, just um, machine learning on language or language technology. Bring those two together because it's all about control. With that, I'll end and take a few questions. <laughs>